Last year I casually upgraded my backup PC, doing some benchmarks before and after for my own personal satisfaction. But it was so interesting that I ended up spending loads of time looking through the results and I decided I should probably try and justify the time spent on this by making this video. But before I knew it, this video had become a huge sprawling mess of tests and theories and disclaimers, so just enjoy this video. But don't see this as a CPU review, because a lot of the situations are at least a bit GPU limited. Which, given that I tried to upgrade the CPU to something decent, is good, I guess? AMD's AM4 platform has had one of the longest and most rewarding lifespans of any motherboard standard ever in the history of the literal universe. Because with most processors, if you want to upgrade to anything significantly newer or better than what you already have, it tends to require you replace the motherboard and RAM as well. But AM4's era spanned multiple processor generations, during which time they saw significant performance boosts and cool new technologies. Meaning that for just the price of a new processor, you can bring an aged rig up to a fairly decent modern day standard. And to show this, I upgraded from the oldest generation of AM4 to the newest. Now, if you're on a 2-core Athlon or 4-core Ryzen from 2017 or something like that, then the performance leap you'll see from jumping to a Ryzen 5600 or above will be immense. But I didn't start that low in the first place. My backup PC originally had a Ryzen 1800X, a flagship processor from 2017. This processor has seen a lot. It started life as my primary setup, powering the Old Grub Trilogy and beyond. Then it went to a friend for a couple of years, and now it's back with me again in a secondary rig because it's still pretty decent for rendering and stuff, what with it having 8 cores. But with it being the first generation of Ryzen's, and being about 8 years old now, understandably those cores are relatively slow by modern day standards. But only because AMD has made significant leaps with every processor generation they've made since then. And while it's still good enough for me, nobody else is going to take me seriously if I use a first gen Ryzen in 2025 to benchmark stuff. So when I found a 5700X 3D on offer for £127, I went out and got it. This is a processor released in 2024, it's got the same number of cores as my old processor has, but it's about 2.5 Ryzen generations newer. And it has 3D cache, which gamers love because it makes your frame rates consistently high. The downside of X3D cards from this era is that it has lower clock speeds than non-X3D versions do. But on the whole, the lower clock speeds on the X3D processor only minorly impact its productivity results, while the inclusion of X3D cache proves to be a major net positive for gaming. The best gaming processor I could have upgraded to on the AM4 platform would have been the slightly faster 5800X3D, which is clocked 400MHz faster than the one I got, but it just wasn't worth the extra money in my opinion. Online, I couldn't find gaming benchmarks which compared the 1800X to the 5700X 3D, which I guess is good because it means this video has more reason to exist. It's just that the age and performance difference between these two processors is too great for most reviewers to consider testing them together. But if I make a few assumptions from this graph, it looks to be about 60% more potent in gaming, which is pretty cool given that at 4.1GHz, the new processor is only 100MHz faster than the 1800X that I'm upgrading from. Which doesn't sound like it's worth the upgrade, does it? But it's thanks to the optimizations made in newer generations of Ryzen and the power of 3D cache that it's still a very worthwhile upgrade, as you'll see from my testing. Don't expect this video to be a purely CPU limited review of it. This is a real setup in my room that I tested in real use cases that I might encounter in day to day use. And I was just curious to see how this processor upgrade affected all manner of situations, which in a way I think makes this video more interesting than being just another CPU benchmark video. Because I think it's where it doesn't improve the situation that's just as important as where it does. I started with some 3D Mark tests, which although synthetic, nicely sum up this upgrade. The CPU test was improved by over 50%, the not very demanding Night Raid test was also improved by 50%, and the graphically demanding Steel Nomad test didn't change at all because in this test it's my graphics card that's limiting things. So we know something already, if you're going to be gaming in GPU limited situations, then your frame rates might not improve by much, but the minimums might. An example of this was when I tested Assassin's Creed Mirage. The new processor was actually a little bit slower on average than the old processor was, I don't know why, but what's important is that the 1% and 0.1% lows were marginally better. This shows that the X3D cache is doing its part by reducing the number of stutters you might notice in games. This is particularly evident when comparing the frame rate chart at the end of this benchmark, where to put it technically, the 1800X's line is squigglier and it shows more frame rate variations. The 5700X3D's looks flatter in comparison, meaning that it's ironed out some of the squiggles, though having a higher average FPS also helps with this. You'll notice there are still a few freak frame weight dips here and where, 
enough to make even the 1% lows similar between the two processors. So maybe this is a game where you'd have to track the 10% lows to see the better frame times that the X3D processor can yield, which I didn't bother doing. Still, it did surprise me that the other optimizations to the processor meant nothing to its overall performance in this game, regardless of whether I was being CPU or GPU limited. Ready or not, incredibly, saw the exact opposite thing happen, where the average frame rate improved on the new processor, but the 1 and 0.1% lows actually dropped. A bit. I put it down to random variants in the runs, but is that fair? And again, it's only once you hit the 5 or 10% lows that the X3D's superiority starts to show through. But then, remember that I'm not really testing processors here. I'm gaming at maxed out graphics settings, making me GPU limited to the point where this is more of a graphics card test than it is a CPU one, especially when testing the faster processor. Sorry, but not sorry, because this is how I, and likely most other people, would choose to play this game, regardless of the processor they're on. So it's interesting to see how the processor upgrade performs in practice, and it suggests to me that there's more to consistent frame pacing than merely a CPU upgrade into an old system, and perhaps had I clocked the RAM higher, or switched to a faster NVMe drive or whatever, then maybe it could have improved performance more than just the processor upgrade had done alone. I guess you could see my PC was not ready for this game. <laughs> Next I tested Hogwarts Legacy in the very processor demanding castle area of the game. The X3D processor worked its magic boosting the average frame rate by 55% and the 1% lows by 45%. It still isn't ideal, and it will mean that I avoid the worst frame rate dips that I might encounter in a game such as this. So it definitely helped the frame rates where it counted, but couldn't entirely shift the stubborn 0.1% lows, which were perhaps more to do with another component in my system, or just because this game is dog shit and incapable of elegantly loading new areas here and there. I tested Cyberpunk at low and ultra graphic settings, and the results at ultra settings didn't change much at all, rather predictably. But at low settings, it ran 30% faster on average, and it delivered a much more stable frame rate. But somehow, I don't think anybody would opt to play the game like this, since even on the old processor, it was pumping out over 100 FPS on average, and only dropping to 84 at its worst. So what's the point in the X3D processor improving on an already good performance? Obviously, you'd be running this game at higher graphic settings instead which unfortunately renders this processor upgrade irrelevant. I hate Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Well, I love the game, but I hate how it runs, and I don't trust the graphics menu to actually make the changes to it that I request. But still, the X3D processor improved the experience by about 50%, which at the frame rates I was getting made a meaningful and appreciated difference to the gameplay experience. But you know what made an even bigger difference? Switching to the 5060 Ti 16GB. Now granted, the 5060 Ti is a bit faster overall than the 4060 Ti, but the VRAM is more of a change, and so by doing an unconventional sort of testing, we've possibly discovered something pretty rad. Assuming that the VRAM is the factor here, we've discovered that a processor upgrade can still improve a VRAM limited situation somewhat, but you're probably best off remedying the VRAM situation. And without the original graphics card to return to, and I'm willing to go through the hassle of slotting the 1800X back into my PC again, I'm just going to move on from here. The more I work on this video, the more there is to cover, and at every point I'm discovering more little rabbit holes that I can jump down. For instance, when capturing this footage just for background filler for this video, the game slightly snuck frame gen on again, and this radically boosted the lows. I'd noticed this and I re-recorded it for this video, but if I could, it would have been interesting to return back to the 4060 Ti again and to see how much frame gen changes the low performance. Will it iron out the stutters, or will it just run into VRAM limits and tank the performance further? I tested another poorly optimised game, Starfield, and sure enough, the average FPS didn't budge at all, but the lows and minimums still improved by 60%, which is a huge and meaningful improvement. Again, I was probably testing under quite GPU limited conditions here, yet it still managed to improve the experience substantially. Armour Reforger's average frame rate didn't budge from the upgrade, but the 1% lows were much higher and it brought the 0.1% lows up from 7 FPS to 37. In other words, the X3D processor helped me to avoid some really horrible stutters and hitches in this game as I was flying about the map. A transformative experience. Deus Ex Mankind Divided ran slightly faster overall, but saw its lows boosted significantly. Nice to see a processor upgrade can improve the experience even in games that were released before the old processor was. I was curious to see how both processors could handle an eSports title, and I chose to test CS2 because I happen to have played that series a few times in my life. And nowhere more than in this title was my experience so different from the benchmark results. So first of all the benchmarks, 
because they're raw figures that I can show, it makes the 5700X3D out to be superior in every way when playing offline against bots. However, online, where you're likely going to be playing this game, while the average frame rates were greatly improved, the lows were not. In fact, just like Ready or Not, they got worse. Now, minimums in this game are, again, very highly variable, even when I repeated the test under the same conditions several times. It turns out that playing Deathmatch on a full server on the same map still yields variations that you just cannot control these in a multiplayer game. I suspect the netcode is to blame, impacting the minimum FPS greatly even when using a more powerful processor. And to prove this, here I am on a much more powerful RTX 5090 3900K setup and you can still see the minimums plummeting simply from the end screen being displayed. Granted, overall performance on this PC was still much better overall than anything I achieved on the AM4 platform, which I guess is to be expected. Nobody's claiming that processors like the 5700X3D are the best, they're just a lot better than other processors on the same platform. But none of this matters, because you don't need a processor this fast to do well in this game. Because along with the benchmarking, I leave notes on my experience as I go. And get this, I found the experience to be perfectly playable on both processors. Silky smooth, despite the reputation this game has for not running well. The only time I noticed significant stuttering or hitching during gameplay was in the first minute or so of playing on the 1800X processor as I turned corners or fired weapons, which was extremely irritating but I assumed it must have just been caching stuff in because then after that the experience on all processors was pretty much identical, even if the benchmarks varied wildly. How? How can lower frame rates in CS2, as in still in excess of 100, still feel responsive in a Twitch title such as this? I have covered this previously. CS2 has extremely good latency, probably helped by the Source 2 engine being optimised for VR and from features like Reflex. So even at lower frame rates, I think Counter-Strike feels more responsive than other titles do, like say Talos Principle 2, which handles like ass even when the frame rate is rather good. CS2 being a bit of a weird example, I delved into the frame view readings a bit deeper and discovered some interesting stuff beyond the usual frame rate analysis. Although this new processor's TDP is apparently higher, the Ryzen 5700X3D is one of the most efficient processors that you can get. It punches above its weight for gaming performance per watt, so you might be surprised to see that it and the graphics card are consuming more power than with my old processor in the system. And it's hotter too. But think about it for a second. The GPU is consuming more power because the processor is faster, which means the graphics card is rendering considerably more frames a second, which consumes more power. And while the CPU is consuming fractionally more power than the old one did, since it's often outputting 50% more frames a second, it's doing each of these frames more efficiently. You could cap it to the same frame rate as the older processor is doing and it would be consuming a lot less. So that's how a more efficient processor can still result in all your components in your PC consuming more power. It's counterintuitive, but it's cool to pick apart and to understand why. I had to show the CPU utilisation because way too many people think that it isn't CPU limited unless the CPU utilisation reaches 100%, but that really isn't how things work in processor land. In productivity tests, perhaps? But games tend to be limited to the speed of the fastest core. Given that these are 8-core processors, I actually find it quite reassuring that we're seeing 30 or 40% utilisation because it shows the game is actually making use of multiple cores in games. I'm also relieved that it didn't become badly GPU limited, as once that figure hits about 98% then it's reasonable to assume that I've set the graphics settings high enough where I'm merely benchmarking the graphics card's performance rather than the processor's. So how about that, despite gaming at 1440p and on very high settings, it still wasn't a hard GPU limit. So all you people running about this game at low resolutions and settings, you could probably be upping it by quite a lot and you'd still be getting a pretty similar experience but without hurting your eyes from immense pixelation. Overall, I'd say the 5700X3D has been a worthwhile upgrade. For me, because now I can say that I have two quite modern processors in my house. When it came to testing games, either things didn't change at all, or they improved by about 50% or sometimes even more than that. It just made my PC feel a lot more capable for gaming. But it does depend on the title in question and on the graphics settings that I'm using. It's just nice to know that I've gone from using a processor that's probably slower than the one that games are designed to run on, to being one that's probably a fair bit faster. And the X3D cache is just nice to have, it makes me feel like I have an advantage that most gamers don't have when playing games. There is an unfortunate mindset though that I commonly see in hardware where the moment something better comes out, it somehow magically makes everything out before it seem worse. 
as though your PC is getting downgraded every time a new generation of processors comes out. Now obviously that's ridiculous, and I frequently see people wanting to upgrade from setups that I still think are half decent, and I worry they'll be left disappointed when they discover a faster processor isn't the magic cure to all their gaming problems that they thought it might be. Now the upgrade to the 5700X3D hasn't brought performance on my PC up to the cutting edge. A newer 7800X3D or 9800X3D would definitely be faster than this chip is. But I'm not sure if there are really that many use cases where the performance differences between this chip and those really matters right now. Maybe it would if you're in a poorly optimised game like Escape from Tarkov. Time for a confession that I fear puts me at odds with every other gamer in existence. I don't actually mind stutters in games. I'd rather not have them, but they don't irritate me as much as they seem to annoy everybody else. I think it's because I was forged through rougher eras of gaming where I embraced sub 30 FPS gameplay in Driver 2 on the PlayStation, or where I'd step over an invisible line in Morrowind and expect a stutter as it loaded in a new map cell. For me, it almost seems weird to not get a stutter as I transition from being in a cave to being in an outdoor environment, or in the first 20 seconds of gameplay where I assume it's just loading stuff in and caching models. So my brain seems equipped with a filter that ignores infrequent frame rate hitches. Now don't get me wrong, if it's a painful stutter every 5 seconds or so, or one that seems tied to my fire button or when I'm dodging attacks, then that's unacceptable to me too, but a brief frame rate drop every minute or so doesn't do much to ruin my experience in most games. So when I see somebody complaining that a World of Warcraft town is slowing their PC down, I just ask, so what? There's no gameplay there, you're just running about and typing to people. I really don't see why you'd care about your performance there. And now I say stuff like that, it's made me question the way I benchmark stuff. Hogwarts Legacy, for instance. I test the Hogwarts Castle area because it's the most demanding place in the game. Sort of like a worst case scenario. But it isn't really because it doesn't matter about the frame rate there, because the gameplay in this region of the map is all about heading from A to B and then soaking up the atmosphere. High or reliable frame rates aren't required here. So any conclusions drawn from benchmarking this place doesn't apply to combat or actual gameplay. So maybe benchmarking should be less about testing the most demanding bits of the game and more about testing the most gameplay sensitive sections. I test using the built in benchmark because it's quick, easy and consistent to use. All good qualities when benchmarking a game, but kind of pointless for people playing it. So maybe the best way to benchmark is just to throw numbers aside and to run about shaking the camera around as I murder everyone in sight, and then report back on how fun the experience was. Truthfully, this whole test has made me appreciate just how capable a processor like the 1800X still is. So what's the verdict? Is a 5700X3D processor an alternative to a newer build? No. If you're building a new PC, then either go mega budget with something like this. I mean, come on. A full gaming PC with 8 fast cores and ray tracing support for £340 is not to be sniffed at. This would be an ideal rig for a child wanting their first gaming PC, or if you just want to be able to run stuff for the time being. It is absolutely unbeatable value. However, if you're looking to spend more than this, then I'd seriously recommend considering something on the AM5 platform instead, if for nothing else than for the chance to upgrade to something much better in about 5 years time again. Building an AM4 PC right now is just buying into a dead platform where all its benefits have already been spent, and your PC's performance is about more than just the processor and graphics card. You can get better standards of RAM and faster PCI support on newer standards and you've been missing out on these with an AM4 build. In fact, I think I could have got even more out of my 5700X3D in these tests, simply by clocking the DDR4 RAM a bit higher. But then it wouldn't have been fair because the 1800X is restricted to a lower speed. Should I? Shouldn't I? Eh. But again, you don't need to worry yourself about this. Simply build a new rig on AM5 and get superior performance all round. But I don't think the 5700X3D is for that purpose. It's here to extend the lifespan of an older PC for a while longer to cut down on e-waste, to see this processor as a cost-effective stopgap. Thanks to this new processor, I'll probably get another 3-4 to four years out of my backup rig. And then, once I do finally upgrade, I've had a few more years to save up and the PC I end up buying will be a few years newer than if I bought the cutting edge today. So with that in mind, although it cost me £127, in the long run it's probably saved me quite a bit of money.